Complutense. 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 Um, and uh, floor is yours. So you have about what, one hour, and then we'll have a discussion. Okay. Okay. Um, so what I will present is uh, it's, it's more like a research uh, project. So it's quite broad in scope. It's not very detailed. And in fact, I'm looking for feedback, maybe to to know how to make it a bit more precise. So I apologize if it's not uh, it's not a very well uh, worked out presentation. But the general idea, so. So my project basically uh, is to uh, is to formalize uh, a pragmatic conception to give a, an analytic framework for a pragmatic conception of scientific theories. So just to give a, a bit of background, uh, as you probably know, there are, there have been various ways of understanding what a scientific theory is in the in philosophy. Uh, in the first half of 20th century, it was, it was quite usual to think of theories as statements expressed in a theoretical vocabulary, statements speaking about the world. And then, in the middle of 20th century, people started to say, oh, uh, you know, statements, uh, maybe laws are important, but the most important unit in science are models, so we should focus on models. And then it became commonplace to consider that Scientific theories are families of structures, families of theoretical models. And you have some kind of nice formalism for this kind of view, which is called the semantic view, which was developed by uh, Super, uh, Van Frassen and others. You're, you have a lot, lot of uh, nice formal tools, uh, the model theory, uh, the possible world semantics. Uh, the general idea that uh, so, is that the laws of the theory do not really constitute the theory, they're more like a way of describing this family of structure that is the theory. And this family of structure is what is really used by sci scientists to represent the world. And in this view, uh, there is still some kind of what we shall call an absolute semantics. So the idea that the interpretation of, of the theory is not really contextual. It's uh, <coughs> usually you have, first you have the idea that any structure satisfying the laws is a model of the theory. So any, uh, for example, any structure that satisfy the, the axioms of uh, Newtonian mechanics would be a model of Newtonian mechanics. And and you will have this idea that a model is a kind of possible world if the theory is true. So basically, a theory gives you a big set of possible worlds. Uh, okay, and then this idea is a bit disconnected from uh, scientific practice and from what scientists call a model. When scientists uh, use models, they don't, they never represent the, the whole world, they represent a particular system. Well, I, I will go back to all the, the differences that we can find, but uh, basically we can say that starting from the 80s maybe with uh, the work of Nancy Cartwright and others, people starting to think that Maybe so. Maybe theories are nothing without the models, but the models are nothing without the users of the model. And there was a return to practice, to philosophy of science in practice, which is sometimes called a practical term, with this idea that to understand what the model means, what the model represents, you have to to know how it's used by its users. You have to take into account uh, informal aspects, contextual aspects. There are ideas uh, of this kind already in uh, the work of Thomas Kuhn, uh, uh, notably the focus on uh, yeah, models as paradigm and the, the notion of an informal aspect, that building a model is not necessarily like an algorithmic process. You take the theory, you apply it to a case, and it's kind of, you have uh, rules to follow. It's more like an informal, uh, it's like, an, an Nancy Cartwright, I think, say it's like an art sometimes. Building a model is an art. And so these people uh, put forth 
a certain number of observations about scientific practice. Among them, the idea that models distort theoretical rules. Uh, they idealize, or they, they use uh, approximation and so on. Sometimes they even incorporate incompatible theories. So you, in physics, you can have a model of uh, a quantum system that is within a classical environment, so an environment that is described in classical physics. So um, it's not necessarily a problem for scientists to do this kind of bricolage, uh, uh, <laughs> this kind of, uh, you know. Uh, tinkering. Sorry? Tinkering. Tin tinkering, okay. Tinkering. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is a, an idea put forth by Cartwright, notably. She, she says uh, the laws of the theory are never applied directly to a concrete system. There are always some steps to, to apply it. Then you have this idea that model incorporate domain specific postulates or empirical inputs, but also postulates that don't directly derive from uh, the observations. An example of this is the, are the models of supraconduction, which incorporated uh, some specific postulates that do not strictly derive from uh, the theory of electromagnetism. Uh, there's a famous uh, collective uh, uh, book from, uh, edited by Morgan and Morrison, who was, who was dedicated basically to say that models are autonomous entities. They are like mediators between the theory and uh, and the uh, applications in the world. Uh, models can caricature the targets, they idealize the target systems, and all this is somehow sensitive to the aim of modelers. So again, it's not an algorithmic process. And so, as I, as I said, model construction is an art, and model application too. You could, you could also say the same thing, so you have this step of uh, building a theoretical model from a theory, and then you have the step of, step of applying a model to an experimental uh, situation, something like that. And, and in experiments too, there are informal aspects, how to use the instruments, how to calibrate the instruments, and all this is not uh, part of the theory itself. It's, like, it's more like a know-how, and it's not always a strictly formalized. So, so far, so good. We have. Uh, we can say that we moved from a syntactic conception, models as statement, to a semantic conception. Oh, sorry, uh, theories as statements. To a semantic conception, theories as families of models, and then to a pragmatic conception, theories as uh, models that are part of an ecosystem of users, context, etc., and methods, etc. But uh, contrary to the semantic view. There is no analytic framework. There, there is no, there, there's no standard semantic tools to analyze the content of theories. And so my projects, basically, the way I present it usually is that I want to make some steps towards building this kind of framework. And as I will say later, what I my uh, method to do so is to. Uh, is to import some tools from the philosophy of language, so from pragmatics in philosophy of language, and to transpose all these tools to a scientific representation. And before to say a bit more about that, I want to give some desiderata for why uh, a possible word semantic is unfit why we cannot really be conservative in this matter and we need something more. So among the problem with... Uh, <coughs> so pos the possible word semantics, I take it very strictly as the idea that a model is a possible world if the theory is true. So the theory gives you uh, absolute laws that are applicable everywhere uh, without contextual aspects. And so Basically, the consequence of this view is that any model, any structure that satisfies the, the laws of the theory is a possible world if the theory were true. And so the problem, the problems with this view, this uh, possible semantic, possible world of semantics, is that, well, in light of all that I've just said, all the observations of pragmatic philosophers, uh, 
we can conclude that not all models strictly satisfy the laws of the theory, because uh, as I just said, they, sometimes they distort the laws, they caricature the laws, they, yeah, they distort the laws. And we cannot, and not all structures satisfy the laws, satisfying the laws are relevant either. So, uh, because a lot of uh, structures that strictly satisfy those of the theory are simply irrelevant from uh, the point of view uh, of a practicing scientist. So it's n neither necessary, necessary nor sufficient to satisfy the laws of the theory to be uh, a relevant scientific model. Then a second problem is that models do not represent complete worlds. They do not uh, represent the universe as a whole. So a possible world is supposed to represent the universe in all its detail. <coughs> Every proposition is either true or false in a possible world. But uh, that's not true of scientific models. In general, they represent uh, a bounded system, a local system. And the propositions about what is outside don't matter. So we could say they are neither true or false, they, they are irrelevant. Uh, and even when in cosmology, where models do represent the universe as a whole, where it's a coarse grained representation, the models of cosmology are <coughs> homogeneous. So there is this postulate uh, of, that is often made in cosmology that the universe is homogeneous. But of course, it's not. We can see that there are lots of <laughs> homogeneities everywhere. So, so it's always coarse grained, and uh, most of the time it's uh, local and bounded. Then the third problem is that models represent types rather than instances in general. There are exceptions, but most of the time uh, models represent a type of phenomena or a type of system. It do not represent uh, one particular uh, object of the world. And a fourth issue is that models are often intentional rather than extension. So uh, very often models uh, integrate some, uh, they contain some kind of causal structure. And this causal structure is informative not only about what is actual, but what about what would be the case if we did something else, or uh, models in physics. Uh, is often based on the state space and usually you have variables and you can uh, say oh if if this uh, if I had did this if I had measured this for example I would have obtained this and so on. But what do you mean they are intentional or they look intentional? Uh, well, because it's a desirata, so so it's what you want. Or it's oh, what so the, this desirata. I take it to be what is the case of actual scientific models okay. in the way they are used and the, the way their content is normally interpreted. So maybe we can discuss this, but I, uh, I think that this is the case that uh, in general uh, their content is intentional and it's, uh, it can support counterfactual reasoning, for example. You can use okay. a model and uh, say and, and produce a counterfactual from your models. And a last point is that models sometimes, uh, I think that sometimes models prescribe rather than merely describe uh, the situation. Uh, this is more clear in uh, engineering practice, I, I guess, where models, uh, you can build a model of a bridge and um, the point of the model is not to describe an actual bridge, it's to tell us tell the users what we want, what we want to achieve in the world. So there is a prescriptive uh, aspect sometimes. And so I would like a semantic to account for these five uh, features. And I think a possible situation semantic can, uh, can do this, but a possible world semantic cannot, cannot really do any of this. I have a small question for clarification. So if you say models can prescribe rather than describe, <coughs> You, you, you mean that sometimes they can also, what they do is also prescribing. Um, it's not their first purpose. Um, 
because it sounds like prescribing becomes more important than describing as you formulated, but as you explained it, you gave some example, yes, sometimes in engineering, it can be more prescri prescriptive. Um, yeah, I think we should not assume that uh, they are by default that they describe stuff. Uh, yeah, but not prescribe either by default. No. Uh, okay. No. Because that might be not a, a model is like it's almost by definition something that is I mean, what you should what is supposed to be good. It's <coughs> model behavior. It's, yeah. I, mean, I mean there is a, a normative. I mean it's debatable. And we we could enter into details, but uh, so a pure case of description would be the model of a remote star. Where obviously we cannot act on the remote star. Then you could say, but in order to to check whether your model is correct, you need to do things here on Earth to measure stuff. I mean, you can enter in discussions like that. Uh, I don't want to take a strong stance on this uh, because you could say, well, yes, but what you're doing here on Earth is only instrumental. So we are observing that the real subject matter will go to subject matter later. The so real subject matter of the model is a real star. You do not act on the real star. So. So I would I would like to remain. I, I think I think what we should say that they sometimes they describe, sometimes they prescribe. They can do both. Okay, and then so basically all this the the main point of the project is to account for some pragmatic aspects of scientific practice. Uh, but in a kind of formal way, to give some kind of uh, unity to all this work, which is done in a bit in an informal way by philosophers of science. You have a lot of case studies say, oh, look, this is interesting, this is interesting. But I would like to make some steps towards a more overarching framework to understand all the pragmatics aspect. And luckily, I think that there is a precedent in philosophy, which is uh, in philosophy of language, where almost exactly the same kind of problems occurred like some uh, decennies ago with the philosophy of uh, ordinary language and its opposition to uh, the formal, formal semantics. So just to, to remind you a bit what's at stake, there was, a, there was all this formal semantic stuff developed by uh, philosophers of language or by, by uh, Russell, and so on, with the more or less explicit uh, objective to, to put aside the pragmatic features. So you have, uh, it's rather clear in Frege that he says, yeah, ordinary language is complicated, you have a lot of contextual stuff, but first we'll develop an idealized uh, view of language, of purely a contextual formal semantics in terms of correspondence between sentences in the world. And then the other is kind of noise that we could, it's like a second order feature or something like that. And then all the philosophers of ordinary language uh, kind of resisted this. They wanted to say no, context is more important, it's more central, you have, and they put emphasis on all the, the contextual aspects of, uh, of ordinary language, such as uh, well, just about prescription, the, 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 the performativity of language. Sometimes we say things, you know, we give order, we make promises, and we are acting by speaking, speech act theory, and so on. Uh, the modulation of meaning by context. Uh, if you say, uh, there are many examples. One example is, uh, if you say, oh, my case is heavy, it's not the same as saying my uh, dinner was heavy. It's not the same sense of heavy. Or all these kind of contextual modulations. And these people wanted to say that it's central and that you could not first give uh, an absolute theory of meaning and then kind of adapt it to take into account the context, but it should be the other way around. Uh, you should first account of uh, meaning as use, as, uh, as what's, as in terms of the function it plays in context, and then you can give a story of a kind of more absolute or conventional meaning that, that emerged from this. Uh, 
uh, this is, for example, Grice's theory of meaning, who say that meaning is, uh, is first and foremost an intention to, uh, to convey beliefs to an audience. And then you can, uh, you can account for the absolute meaning, the timeless meaning of words in terms of the norms in the linguistic community. The norms regarding how you could normally uh, convey beliefs to an audience. So basically, the, the idea is to take the contextual meaning to be uh, more primitive, and then the, the a contextual meaning to be kind of uh, more uh, secondary, derivative. Uh, okay. Uh, so. And all these people, and eventually, so all these people were reacting to formal uh, semantics, but eventually there were people like Grice or Kaplan, or people like this, who uh, uh, provided tools uh, for, for analyzing this aspect, in particular indexicality. I maybe it started with indexicality. Uh, so uh, the analysis of uh, words like I, now, this, which only have a reference in context. And then it was extended to uh, other stuff. And part of it is the notion of situations and the notion and truth, and that then derived to a notion of truth maker semantics or a notion of topics of subject matter and philosophy of language. I will explain a bit more uh, how these in particular are used in philosophy of language because it will be central to my project, this notion of uh, topics or subject matter. But for now, the idea is, is well, let's, uh, let's loot philosophers of language. Let's take all their tools and uh, <laughs> transpose them to, uh, to, uh, the, to the philosophy of science. And I will be in particular interested in the notion of topic, subject matter, and why this is so. Well, uh, because it's uh, basically it, the notion of topics and subject matters are, are used to account for propositional attitudes. So, uh, uh, well, I will say more about this later, but. Okay, but basically, so this is my this is a, my my research project for the future that I'm trying to make a bit more uh, precise now, and part of it was already done in my past work. So I started, uh, for example, in uh, several articles, I started uh, taking some uh, the Grice's uh, distinction between. Uh, contextual meaning and conventional meaning. I started to apply it to uh, scientific representation, indexicality, uh, comes with it in the same package. And I, I just want to continue this. And also, in, <coughs> as uh, some of you know, uh, in my uh, PhD thesis, I, I talked a lot about situations. And uh, as it happened, all this stuff about topics and subject matters, and uh, they, are, they, also, they also talk about situations. So there is a there is a uh, <laughs> yeah maybe yeah there are affinities between my past work and this stuff so I want now I want to make it more explicit more okay so I will say a bit more about topics so why topics from what I've read recently, uh, I've read uh, papers and books from uh, Diablo, Fine, Hoax, and I have to read uh, the one from Berto, Berto. that, he, that uh, Florian sent me. And what they have uh, in mind basically is uh, to account for uh, propositional attitudes. So, an example of motivation is uh, a case where John say, I have chicken wings for dinner. And then if you say, 
John said he will have chicken for dinner. This sounds okay, because having chicken for dinner is part of having chicken wings. It's part of what John said. But if you say, John said that he will either have chicken wings or chicken breast for dinner. Well, no, that's not what John said. He said he would have a chicken wing. So what's weird with this example is that in both cases, if you take the standard intentional analysis in terms of possible words, uh, you will you could be puzzled as to why the first one is correct but not the second one because in each case the second one is a consequence logical consequence of the first one having chicken is a consequence of having chicken wings and having either chicken wings or chicken breast is a logical consequence of having chicken wings and what these people say is that in order to have the right fine graining for the content of what John said you cannot be satisfied with a pure intentional analysis in terms of possible words. You have to, you must bring in something else, which is a notion of topic. So according to them, the problem is that the second, in the second uh, consequence of John had, uh, John will have uh, chicken wings, changes topics. So it's not, it brings in something that is not relevant to the subject matter. Well, the first one stays in the topic. That's what they, they want to say, basically. And so they have this theory about topics, linguistic topics, and this theory is about parthood, a parthood relation. Some topic is part of another one. Whether John will have a chicken or not is, is a topic, and it's part of the topic of whether John will have chicken wings or chicken breast or something. Uh, Okay, and why th this is relevant to the philosophy of science? Because it's about the attitude that users, linguists, users of language have towards the sentence that they make. And so the idea is that, well, scientists also have attitudes towards their models. Uh, their models have a purpose. That's, all, that's exactly what all the pragmatic philosophers say. So models have a purpose. It's important to, take, to account the, purp the purpose. And so it seems that this notion of topic is really tailor made to, to address this issue in philosophy of, of science too. And then you have some formalizations of topics. Basically, uh, one of the first ideas comes from uh, Lewis, who say that a topic is a partition of possible words. Uh, we can take uh, as an example to understand the idea uh, if you're wondering about how many stars there is in the universe. Uh, how many stars there is in the universe? There are several possible answers to this question. There can be zero, one, two, three, and so on. And each uh, answer to this question will correspond to a set of possible words. The set of possible words where there is zero, one, two, three, four stars. And so his idea that if we partition the space of possibilities in terms of how many stars there are, then doing that is exactly uh, presenting the topic of how many stars there are in the universe. So a topic it can be thought to be equivalent to a question, and it can be formalized as a set of answers to this question. So here, partition means it's an exhaustive set Offenses. It's either one, two, three stars, and, and so on, but you exhaust the possibilities, and every possibility is, is uh, exclusive, mutually exclusive. This is what a partition is. Then, as far as what I've read so far in the literature, my impression is that Diablo likes these ideas, but he wants to, wants to make it more flexible for ordinary languages. So he say partitions, maybe we should uh, replace them with covers, which are sets of possible words that cover a, 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 sub, a situation of reference, something like that. And this is a way to account for vague answers. So if you want, give me the, if you want to say, give me the number of stars, more or less five, you will have sets of possible words that overlap. So this is kind of, they, they add more flexibility. Uh, but 
I'm not very interested. I think it's it's interesting for accounting for ordinary language, but maybe less so for scientific models because uh, in general I think that scientists strive for uh, for uh, precision and having exclusive answers when they ask questions about them, they want the exclusive it's so I, I think the, the partition uh, partitions uh, would be fine at least a uh, first approach towards uh, giving a semantics for scientific models then you have fine who want to get rid of possible words and so he has a completely different approach he starts from what he calls truth makers which are he starts from a uh, build situation from uh, object and properties and this is a kind of state and then a state can make true a sentence or make false a sentence and then he defined topics and he wants some kind of logical properties for his semantics so he wants in possible states you can uh, combine a state where something is red and some a state where something is not red you combine the two it's a new state where something is both red and not red stuff like that and again i don't think it's very relevant to to my project so i'm not very i, I mean it's nice to have this closure maybe for a lot from a logical perspective but i, I don't i don't really see it it was very relevant for my project and then you have peter hopes that i i don't i know him with, i don't know that well what he did but from what I saw, it's like a bit in between fine and yellow, so it could be interesting. But uh, if you have more input, inputs for me, I'm, uh, I'm willing to take all the inputs that you would have on this literature. But I, I only started reading it recently. But uh, my idea is uh, to to have a kind of Lewisian picture where you have partitions of possibility states for uh, situations. So to take a simple picture first, and see where we can go with it. <coughs> uh, another aspect of all this literature is that it's focused on uh, philosophical logic, and so they want to have, they want to build subject matters out of the syntax of logical sentences. So uh, they want to say that if A and B, the subject matter of A and B are defined. The subject matter of A and B is the fusion, fusion of the subject matter of both. Uh, I have nothing against this kind of uh, project, but they're not my focus either, because I have uh, the, the structures of models, so I, uh, which are not necessarily expressed in, uh, in uh, logical sentences. So, uh, and also, and I think there are some diver divergence between philosophers of language on this. Uh, but it's not obvious to me that all the subject matter is, is fully supervenes on the sentences. I would like it to, to maybe to be fixed by a broader context, by the aims of models and something. So I, I would want it to be defined independently of the exact sentence that I use or the exact structure of the model that is used. So that's what I say in this part. Uh, yes, that's the section 2.3 just repeats what I've just said. So I will, I plan to use partitions of situations. Any questions? Yeah? I did not understand why you exclude fine. The fine proposition. Why? Uh, so, what I like about fine is that he doesn't use possible words. And uh, I mean, I would be ready to use possible words as a kind of tool, like technical tool. I, I don't mind. But I don't think that they are very relevant in the end. So that's one part I like. But what I don't like is the 
impossible state. The impossible state. But I thought that was the strength of the proposition of fine. It's the impossible state. It's to have that. At least, at least for philosophy of science, not for philosophy of language. But I don't see how it would but be. Re I mean, f models in science never describe impossible states as as some of the possibilities. So you have state space. Maybe I can wait for the end. Yeah, we can maybe keep yeah. wait for the end. Okay. Anyway. So. I started thinking in terms of possible worlds because it's uh, because it's easier. But I'm open to other propositions. But I started thinking in terms of uh, situations as sets of possible worlds. So, for example, a situation where my computer is on, my, on a table in front of me is a set of possible worlds where my computer is uh, in front of me uh, on the table. Uh, and then, but if we do that, we should not think of possible ones as metaphysical entities, such as some kind of logical possibilities. And in the end, I think I, I, would, I just want I just use them as kind of tools to to describe a system. So I don't think it matters a, a lot. But the idea is, so is a situation you can think of it of it as a set of possible worlds or as maybe a set of information uh, about, about the world, something like that. And then just doing that allows you to have some kind of relations between situations, and notably the fine-graining and coarse-graining situations uh, of situations. If I say that uh, my computer is gray, I'm adding more information into my picture, so I'm restricting the set of possible worlds. It's tinier. This is fine graining. So fine graining is adding more information, and it can be uh, it can be adding temporal information that my computer will be before the ground in two minutes. It can be adding uh, external information that has nothing to do with my computer. That there's also a microphone there, or it can be making more specific the properties of my computer. That it's a kind of uh, yes, I, I don't know, I'm trusted grain or something. Uh, and cost draining is uh, exactly the control. And then I think it makes sense to uh, to describe experimental context in science as finite finite partitions of the possibility space for a given a given cost grained situation. So, I will take examples from physics. Uh, if, uh, if people have, uh, know better about other uh, fields, I'm open to, to uh, remarks. Uh, it doesn't apply to biology or stuff like that. I'm uh, <laughs> ready to hear that. Uh, but the idea that I have from physics is roughly that you, uh, experimenters, will typically uh, put, uh, try to measure specific properties and they expect a priori, you can expect a range of values because this is a range that the apparatus is able to detect. Uh, and this is, roughly speaking, this is a partition of the possibility space for the system that they are measuring. And you could easily expand this picture for a dynamical situation. Then you have a, a set of possible histories, which would be a succession of measurement outcomes, something like that. So, roughly, the idea that you have a situation, which is a set of possible worlds, and this is your experimental situation, and this defines your experimental situations. So if you don't have this, your model simply does not apply. It's kind of the relevant conditions for your experiment is given by a situation of reference. And then you have the topic is completed by a partition of possibility space. This is the question you ask, you want to ask to your system. You want to know whether uh, the electron will go up or down or something like that. And uh, 
And this set space of possibility is a priori. It's okay, a question of relevance again. But which uh, of these possibility will actually occur is not a priori. It depends on the external world, or on the object that you're measuring. And then you could say that, roughly speaking, an applied model will wait, will give uh, some probability weight or all or nothing weight maybe to this partition, to the cells of this partition of possibilities. If we say, uh, if you do that, you will obtain that. If you do that, you will something like that. So it gives weight to uh, possibilities. It can give weight to conceivable histories. And in classical mechanics, at least, uh, usually the model will exclude some possibility. Say this cannot happen, it's impossible. Uh, uh, if you have a pendulum, the model will say, oh, if the starting position is there, then it will, have, it will uh, behave like this. It will have this history, and only one basically will be selected as possible if you give the initial conditions, but you don't have to put in the initial conditions. And then you, have a, you still have a set of possibilities. Uh, but uh, usually it will exclude some possibilities. If you start there, you cannot have a... Or just to take a simple example, if you drop an object, it, can, it won't go up, it will go down towards the earth. Small question for clarification. So if, if it's about um, like excluding possibilities or something like or, or making it less probable or whatever, uh, um, why is the weighing on the, cell of the part cells of the partition and not on the... The, the possible worlds. Uh, because the model does not discriminate between the possible worlds in the same cell. Because it's only about, the model is only about your system and how it will behave. So, I mean, uh, if you apply a model to uh, a pendulum, the model says nothing about whether, uh, what time it is. It doesn't say whether the sun is up in the sky or down because your model is about a pendulum. So it gives the same weight to all the possible worlds where the pendulum behaves in a certain way, but it won't discriminate between the possible worlds within a cell, so which would uh, uh, contain uh, much more information about everything that is the case elsewhere well in the universe. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's discuss that maybe later. Okay. Yeah. And then, a last aspect of my account, that this is stuff that is already more or less uh, uh, worked out this part. Uh, I, uh, in my book, for example, I present this kind of uh, view more or less. A uh, uh, last aspect is for the instance type that I was mentioning earlier. I think we should consider that an applied model gives weight to uh, the possible outcome of an experiment or cells of, of possibility space. And, but a theoretical model is more general, it's a general model that could be applied to any system of the same kind. And so it could be, it should be modeled, the semantics of a theoretical model should be something along the line of indexicality, it should be a function from context to applied model. The context is exactly what I've presented. It's, uh, a uh, partition of possibility space for a situation. And the uh, theoretical model is a function from this to... It's a, so it's basically it's a function from a partition of possibility space to a weighting of this partition. For any partition, it gives a weighting. If the partition is relevant, because uh, the model does not apply to anything. And... And uh, so, yes, I said all this is uh, more or less worked out. I, I recently I published an article that, that applies this, I, these ideas to quantum mechanics. I don't know if I should go into the details now, but um, because it depends on the time. Ah, no, I don't have time. Okay. <laughs> but uh, basically, I think it fits pretty well with. Uh, with uh, the structure of, of models in physics when they are based on state space. 
at least you can consider that the partition of possibility space is a partition of the state space of the system. And usually when you apply a model to an experimental situation, that's what you need to do. You need to have some kind of partition of, the, of your state space. You have to uh, partition it to set that correspond to the possible outcomes of your experiment. So I think it works pretty well, at least for the models when they are state space. And uh, I applied it to quantum mechanics, and it corresponds quite exactly to the consistent histories approach to quantum mechanics, which is uh, nice, but it gives a different interpretation. And another aspect that is important is that quantum mechanics will put constraints on the context to on, on the structure of context. So that's an interesting uh, aspect. Uh, there is a consistency condition. For example, you know that in quantum mechanics you cannot measure velocity and uh, position with an infinite precision at the same time for a system. This corresponds to incompatible co context of application. They are not uh, consistent together. So the theory looks like uh, a kind of theory that if you apply this picture in terms of context, what you arrive at is that quantum theory is roughly a theory that limits the kind of, that gives you consistency conditions about the context. And in this article, I defend that you should re reify context, basically. So this is something that is part of my project, that is... So you're so a cryptorealist. I say, assuming you're a cryptorealist. <laughs> <laughs> I always knew. <laughs> <laughs> I will assume being a crypto realist and say yes, contexts are real. Uh, they are not in the head, and that's a kind of. I think that that's a, I think it makes a difference between this project and what philosophers of language are saying because they would be tempted to say that a topic, subject matter, or something like in the head of the locutors. Uh, we can discuss that as well, <laughs> if you think it's crazy, or I don't know. But uh, the reason is first quantum mechanics, because if you have this consistency condition that is not a priori, you could say, well, I, that means that there is something to say. I have a kind of proto-argument for this, that uh, uh, if you have the, like the set of possible you have a possible world where you have an infinite precision and an infinite velocity for a system. This is part of the possible world semantics. You can make you make every property very precise. But this possible world will be part of uh, two possible situations, but it's in some sense it's impossible. There is no you you a quantum mechanic would exclude thinking of this as a uh, consistent situations, but it's still part of the of two situations that are acceptable. So this is an argument to say that situations are more primitive than uh, possible ones, and then that uh, we should have some, we should reify the situation and, and the context. Uh, if you're interested in this argument, you can uh, have a look at my paper, Consistent Histories uh, Through Pragmatic Lenses which was published uh, this year. And the second reason that I like to reify situations <coughs> and context is the prescriptive aspect. I think if we want to take it seriously, we say that models can prescribe. And we, if you want to say that the context are not in the head, but they correspond to an experimental situation that is implemented, it is actively implemented by experimenters and this is a, this gives another reason to reify context as some kind of uh, some kind of stuff in the world that is actively implemented and then what we have is roughly the idea the metaphysical picture is that there are in the world there are what I call six situations is situations with uh, a partitioning of probability space and with weights given to the dispositions of uh, their disposition associated with the cells of the partition. There are six situations in the world. There are context, 
and but the theories of physics or of science in general do not tell us which situations in the world exist or not. Only direct experience tells us that there is a situation of this kind with this context. The theory only tells us that if you have this situation and this partitioning of possibility space, then you have you can attribute these dispositions to this situation. So this is the idea that a, th a theoretical model is a function from context to weighting of the context. We do not know which context exists in the world. It's something that only experience tells us. We don't know it from the theory, but the theory can tell us from any context that we are interested in and that we know exists or we suppose exists. It can attribute disposition to, the, to it. This is the general uh, picture. And if we accept this uh, crypto realist picture, uh, then we solve all the, we address all the desiderata that I mentioned earlier. So we have a, an autonomy of models. Uh, I said of course, but I don't know if it's of course. Uh, <laughs> don't know why I, I wrote that. Uh, models are autonomous from series. Well, uh, I didn't. I didn't really talk about series, so maybe it's not clear why. But uh, there is no reason to assume that they are not. They cannot be autonomous because they apply to uh, bounded situations. Models do not represent the whole universe. They apply to contexts, which are situations with uh, partitions of possibility space. Models represent types and not instances. I just explained that theoretical models are a function from context to weighting of the context. Models are intentional. They give weight to possibilities for a situation. And models can prescribe if you take that context can uh, are known by uh, having some kind of intentional state towards them, which is an epistemic uh, limitation that we only know uh, by intentionally uh, by being intentionally related to a concept, we know that it exists. I don't mean that contexts do not exist outside of our intentionality. I just mean that it's a limitation that we have. Uh, then, yes, models can somehow prescribe in the sense that they are relevant conditions. They have relevant conditions that are distinct from their accuracy conditions, and the relevant conditions can be prescriptive. You should implement this situation and, you, and this will be the case. And then, so I didn't go into the formal stuff that is part of what I wanted to discuss uh, this week, but uh, time, was, uh, time goes fast. Uh, time flies. <laughs> but, uh, uh, maybe I can tell more. Thanks, Borza. I propose to take five minutes break and then uh, let's have a discussion. Good.
So let's That's start. Just, oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so let's start again uh, with a discussion. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, okay, uh, we can open the discussion now. Questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question. I wonder about quantum uh, physics. What would be your interpretation? Because sometimes, especially at the very beginning of the presentation, I had the feeling it was quite formal, you know. So of course you describe how models can work and the positioning of pragmatism, the position about that. But eventually if you say it's incompatible model, what does it mean? Uh, when you study at you know uh, physical uh, quantum objects that uh, uh, position and speed are incompatible. Okay, what, what's your interpretation after all? Ah, I guess the answer will be related to uh, your crypto reality. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so, yes, so if you apply the, what I described to quantum mechanics, you get something like the consistency stories approach. And Griffiths, who introduced uh, this interpretation talks about framework, uh, which is roughly a partition of possibility space for dynamical uh, situations. So a, a set of uh, histories for the system, and there is a condition that they are they must be consistent. The histories must be consistent. You cannot have. Uh, a history where the particle has a precise position and another way it has a... This is a way to avoid all the, uh, all the problems you have uh, for the interpretation of quantum mechanics where it makes things uh, like... It's almost like a classical model you have in the end if you respect these uh, consistency conditions. And so I guess your question is how I interpret this condition. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if so it's the classical model, it means so if it's open eye interpretation, it yeah. means there is no interpretation. So, so Griff Griffiths, when he introduced the consistency histories, and all the other ones who had similar views, they were saying it's a model of choice. So, according to them, basically, what Griffiths says, ah, measurement is, a, is not a physical term, we should avoid talking about measurements, measurement outcomes, it's not proper term for a physical theory because we are realist. And then he says, for this reason, I will take the choice of the framework to be just a pragmatic choice from the model. But then this creates a lot of difficulties and everybody uh, criticized uh, the consistent histories specifically for this reason. Because if it's arbitrary, if you have an arbitrary choice at the start of building your model, then your model is not it's not realism after all. It's, they cannot say, ah, I'm realist, so I won't talk about measurement, but then your, your model is completely dependent on an arbitrary choice at the start. <coughs> and so it was criticized for this reason. And, uh, and also because you cannot account for the classicality of the world. So you have lots of criticism of consistent histories which say you cannot explain why the world, the macroscopic world, is classical or almost classical because uh, saying it's classical will depend on the choice of a framework that is classical, but it's an arbitrary choice. So, and you have other frameworks that work just as well, that are not classical at all. Uh, even if you have a model of the full universe, because some are still working on this idea of a model of the universe, even if it's classical up to now, it can, the f your framework can be completely non-classical in the future. So whatever constraint you put in from the past, you still have, it still depends on a, ch a choice from the modeler that the world is classical. And a lot of people say, no, it doesn't make sense, we know that the world is classical, that it will continue to be classical in the future, you won't have weird quantum effects everywhere. So so the consistent histories approach is is bad. And my interpretation is different and that's what basically the topic of my paper is to say uh, there are, you can apply this interpretation but the framework should not be interpreted as a modeling choice. You should go more pragmatist, more neo-Copenhagian and say that the framework corresponds to uh, 
uh, real situations. That's part of the reason to reify the, the context. That you should uh, say uh, that you should reify the, this context and say it's not a modeling choice. It depends on the inputs, empirical inputs from uh, the situation you want to which you want to apply the model. And then the, class, the problem of classicality, well, I have the, I say, uh, I have other responses to it, to say why we should expect the world to continue to be classical, but basically what I'm saying is that it's not the job of quantum theory to explain classicality. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, if I understand well, it means that uh, you are not very free to choose the model. And so according to you, what's a good model for uh, quantum physics? Sorry? I mean, if I understand you, when you are not free to choose any model. Yes. So what would be the, the right model for this it's, it, it's a matter of coordination between your theory and the experimental situation to which you apply the situation. So you have some rules that come from experimental practice, mostly, that tells you that if you have a measurement apparatus in this way and this way, this is this kind of situation, and so you should apply this kind of model. It's yeah, and, and in, in, in quantum physics, what, what kind of answer will you suggest? Or maybe you don't want to, to be committed to that. Uh, answer to what? Yeah, uh, for instance, about uh, measurement, about uh, does uh, quantum particles exist or something like this. Uh, sorry? I mean, I mean, is it true that measurement exists? Is it true that a uh, quantum particle exists in some way? Uh, that kind of answer. If you choose a model, you, you answer to this question. Yes. Maybe you don't want to, to commit. I, I say, yeah. I, I basically, if you want to go realist, uh, but with uh, I, 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 I don't think I'm really a realist because, I, <laughs> but, it, but it's more about. But I'm a bit tired of uh, defending uh, non-realism. So, if people want to, uh, so I just talk as a realist. <laughs> but basically. If you want to be a realist, you can be realist about applied models. That's my main uh, uh, approach. You, you, you can be a realist about applied models. You have an applied model of, with a framework. Mm -hmm. You have an applied model of quantum mechanics with a framework. You can be realist about what the content of the model. The model tells you that you have these possible histories. They are consistent. You have these properties of systems, and you can be realist about that. I wouldn't put the metaphysical uh, weight of realism, but that's another topic. Yeah. Yeah. But for instance, the question is, is it possible to have backward causation? And that can be a good question in quantum physics. But if I understand you, you, you are more providing a way to, to think than a specific answer in uh, I, Yeah, I don't think we, I, I think you will, you, will never, you will never get uh, backward causation. Because that would mean that you could uh, you could intervene uh, on the future and change the past, and that won't happen. All right, but, but yeah, okay. But <laughs> this, is, this is something that well, was I, I have two follow okay. up already to your <coughs> questions. Okay. Uh, it's just a follow up, so it's two follow ups. Uh, after that, really, about that, you could have inconsistent history, backward causation, if the fact in the past has never been measured directly at all. Uh. So, so, but if you have in a way associated to a state in the past where the, the, the value is, you, yeah. you can, you can. Okay. But I think May, can. Maybe, but I don't see any good reason to put this past event into your framework into your possibilities ah, you have, you because have, it's in the past but it's you could, not it hasn't been measured measured why why would why do you need it in but if you but want, maybe if, if you want to model the quantum eraser experiment for example but that's because you want to know something about the past event that has not been measured exactly but uh, but then you are applying a framework that is not strictly speaking. You introduce in your framework a distinction between two possibilities that are not directly measured. And they are not. So you could wonder if this framework corresponds to a real context, because I want to reify context and, uh, of applications. And since it hasn't been measured, you could say, 
Well, no, it's not the real frame. Well, or it's yeah. metaphysics. <laughs> but you have you have constraint on it. You have constraint on it because it, why you talk about causality is because there's some efficiency to this non-measure uh, qubits, for example. Uh. But maybe there's not one way in consistent history to build it. But. Yes, because I would tend to think that, roughly speaking, what a framework is or what a context is, this part partition of possibility space, it corresponds to the information. It's an intuitive way of understanding what it is. It corresponds to the information that is made available by the system to the outside world. Okay. And then this event in the past you could discuss is this information really made available? Uh, it's not available yet. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, maybe. Yeah. I, I have an, another follow up but so so your argument that quantum mechanics force you to reify situation will not apply to classical mechanics. So not not as strongly. So my question is that what is specific in quantum mechanics give you good arguments to reify? Is it the bizarre way in Hilbert space, or is it the fact that quantum mechanics has a very strange way to talk about experiments, or and at least quantum mechanics, contrary to classical mechanics, include the notion of experiments implicitly? What 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 part what part yeah. is doing the work? Yeah, I would say that yeah, it's all the weirdness of the series <laughs> that in general yeah that forces you to think this way and to think that actually it was already the case in in classical physics, but it's just that information is so much available, there's so plentiful information at our scales that it's not easy to detect the fact that it's important to to rectify the framework, but yeah, but, but the argument, the main argument is that is that you have to choose uh, a fine graining, and in classical physics, the fine graining you can choose the the absolute fine graining for everything, uh, infinitely precise position and velocities on continu uh, continuous space, and there's no problem in doing that. But in quantum mechanics, you cannot. Uh, you have to make a choice. You have to sh say when you refine your framework, you start from a coarse grain framework. I measure this these macroscopic properties, and you want to refine it as if you are, you are postulating about what is more precise, what exists more precisely in the world. If you're making this kind of postulates, <coughs> at some point, you have to choose uh, uh, how you will refine your framework, and you cannot do both all refining because they end up incompatible. Well, in, cl in classical physics, you have no problem with this kind. So that's the reason, but I don't know if you'd answer the question. Questions? Good. I have two questions. One which is classical, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand exactly uh, what's the uh, role that the initial uh, Possible, possible worlds do because the Indian differs quickly. You, you get rid of them and you just take a the situation and you get rid of the possible space, possible world, right? Yes. So why do you start by uh, talking about possible world just uh, uh, to do the by your world? Because I think that this way we can visualize the notion of fine graining, coarse graining, just just like it's a restriction of possibility, possible worlds, and so on. So you have a nice way of picturing the the relation between situations. But then if I could just retain the structure of situations and, and uh, throw in the rubbish bin the possible ones, I would be happy with this. Okay. Yeah, because um, I suppose that if uh, you are a semantic, uh, uh, differential semantic uh, theories, you have kept the possible world as a relation in both right? as a thing that structure, as it, all the situations are structured by the possible world uh, the the fair and the fair free side. Anyway, and the well, yeah, I'm confused myself. Uh, second question. So, uh, this is our example. Want to ask a question? 
apparently. Uh, going back to what he said earlier, uh, about the inconsistency of internal inconsistency of model, uh, you gave uh, a nice example of uh, semi-classical mobility, uh, semi-classical uh, models that are internally inconsistent. So why do you uh, just get the total cast that away from your uh, formalism? There are a lot of uh, domestically very good uh, inconsistent models that get to that great uh, research. Like a quantum system in a classical environment? Or For example, or, yeah. Uh, because I think if that if you apply a framework in the end, because the series, that's because I didn't talk uh, about series really, I only talked about models in the presentation, but the series by basically the uh, picture will be very pragmatic that they are instrumental for building models that work and that there are some leeway in the, the way they are applied. So it doesn't really matter if you take them as tools to build a model, but in the end what you have is a kind of structure, of causal structure of events. Yeah. You will end up with something like that. That's yes. a cheap answer. <laughs> no, it's just not being realist about a series, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, you don't have to be realist about theory to see that you have inconsistent hypothesis in the model that you are. And what model works is a realistic tool, but... But they are inconsistent if they are taken to be absolutely true of everything in the universe. But if you, if you, there is no inconsistency in describing a quantum uh, system in a classical environment, if you, you could say, uh, if you are a crazy metaphysicist, you would say, oh, my, my system is the only system in the world that is quantum, that has quantum ontology, and all the rest of the universe has a classical ontology. And I don't see any inconsistency. You just you just put in arbitrary restrictions of uh, the domain of application of your series. You say the external world obeys to these laws, everything except my system. And my system obeys to quantum laws and as a quantum ontology, but only my system. And everywhere else, it's everything is classical. If you think it's obviously, I don't think it's you can it makes sense to to claim that seriously. I don't, but. But it's not inconsistent, and so I don't, I don't need a, I, so the, the end product of your process does not rest on formal inconsistency in the end. Yeah, okay. if, if you're instrumentalist about series, I have a follow-up. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the kind of stuff that leads uh, like Frigg and others to become be more fictionalist, because then you have a lot of models that you know are non possible it's this stuff that still works in practice, right? So But then again yeah, the, yeah. the main point is being realist yeah. about applied models. <coughs> and so if your theoretical model is inconsistent, uh, it doesn't matter. You take it as a function from context to uh, applied model. The applied model is just a weighting of possibilities and I don't see any inconsistency in this weighting of possibilities. Uh, so I, I don't need the inconsistent state and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, follow up. Yeah, I see. I see how you resist that. There's in the model there should be no contradiction or something that will make the model explode or okay. But my impression is that your position force you to adapt to really separate quantum from classical or semi-classical to be separated from quantum to, to have to represent them as different modelization a priori that they could exist independently because they, they strictly apply in certain contexts and they cut the context blah 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 and so in that form you lose something about the heuristic that I don't know when one of the more spectacular of course is that you use you say that particles are quantum but the electromagnetic field is classical. And you have the Aranov bomb effect and you have you discover a lot of stuff and you can modelize a lot of phenomena, new phenomena, and after that you say I learned something about quantum quantum world. New stuff. Because it's not classical. Aranov bone yeah. effect is not, cannot exist in classical in the classical world. But the Aranov bone effect is modelized using 
non-quantum photons. Mm -hmm. And my impression is that you would say, okay, in that context it's applied, blah, 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 but of course it's not quantum. Quantum mechanics is another context, another because the experiments are different and the consistent the auto consistency is different. And so my impression is that your formalism forces you to separate these cases much more than you would like heuristically, pragmatically. Or am I mistaken? Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm not sure I understand what is what the problem is, but I can say one thing. I don't, I'm not sure it will answer the question, but uh, one thing, one nice thing about the consistent stories framework is that you have a nice transition between the quantum and the classical case. So the idea that some frameworks are class, quasi classical, which means that they are arbitrarily close from a classical framework. And if you apply this kind of framework, the resulting model is exactly what you get in a, with a classical uh, model. So in the classic in context where classical mechanics apply. So basically, if you apply a framework where you're interested in the position of a, of a particle, you will get something that looks like events that follow the classical trajectory if you apply a classic classical uh, framework. So there is a smooth transition between the series, and maybe it doesn't answer completely the the kind of worry you have. But I think maybe uh, if I understand better <laughs> the worries, no, I think that would be maybe a pass to to argue that in the end, if in the end every, everything is kind of effective, mm -hmm. applied model are kind of effective, and you get in many contexts you get the same effects from classical and uh, quantum theories, and in some contexts, no quantum uh, models are make very different pr predictions, but then you should apply quantum models. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's not the answer, but I will, if Peter, allow me. Um, and are there other questions? Because maybe so I'll just finish this one. And and okay. So it does not answer, but it's logical. Your answer is logical in your framework. Because your framework is driven by experiments. It's experimental context that yes. fix the reference. And now I'm forcing you to these examples that are really important in the history of physics, like the discovery of the Ion of Bohm effect. That it's discussion among theoretic theory, and you you don't do you don't do a, an approximation to the classical. You just take part of the Classical electromagnetism, classical. Take part of quantum mechanics, pure quantum mechanics. Do something bizarre together. <laughs> Fit it in the world. Get an experiment, win a Nobel Prize. You know? And at the end they say, we learned something. The Arnold of Bonn effect exists yes. in the world as a quantum effect, not as a classical one, because it's excluded from so, the classical one. Yes. So but of course we don't know, because we don't have a Let's imagine that it's impossible or almost impossible to do it in f pure quantum field theory, quantum electrodynamics. We're just, we're convinced that it works because we have this semi-picolage. <laughs> Are you making kind of uh, non-miracle arguments that it works so the theory has been... No, I, I, I just or? want to see that is these theoretical con context could they could they be implied that there's some indexicality there too, but in the theoretical side. I don't know. Because it to me it looks like more uh, a question of epistemology that you have this uh, theoretical heuristics and they work and you you've been modeled and they make predictions that you were not expecting. So the theory works as a good guide to build new models that were never applied before and that eventually uh, correspond to the experimental, to what you get with experiments. So to me it sounds more like some kind of epistemological question. How is it that theories work okay. so well or something like that? So your and question, okay. okay, so you would say... And so I, I how, how 
the fact that we confirm the existence of the Arnaud Bell effect, why does it, why people believe it, they learned something about the quantum, yes. pure quantum? And that would be a, a, a good question. Yes, but then the question answer would be epistemological. And this, my thesis are more semantics, and I don't, I'm not sure there is really a clash between my semantics and the kind of story. Maybe, maybe this semantic is to your point would be my semantics, my way of interpreting models and theories to deflationary, and so you cannot explain this the why theories are such good guides or something like that. Maybe. And then, yeah, it's a fair question, and I I should come up with. Uh, epistemological answers, but to make my semantic compatible with... Uh, Fair enough. Yeah. Good. Other? Then I'll give myself the words. Uh, so I have, I have quite a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> all of things that are not entirely clear to me. Um, but at the same time, I think it's like quite uh, promising seems quite promising what you're proposing uh, and I've had that feeling already since the PhD uh, um, but I'm, there's some, some things I'm confused about and maybe this is all because of course I'm coming from the philosophy of language point of view and, and, and I'm maybe putting too much of that uh, context into what you make of it but um, so you, you, you like switch between possible context, possible situation, possible fixed situation. I mean, there's like a, the, the thing that is possible is, is sometimes um, context, sometimes situation. I'm a bit confused why, while um, at least in, 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 in Kaplan's picture, the Kaplan's picture, um, <coughs> a, a context is, is quite different from uh, uh, um, possible circumstances or possible situations or something like that and it, it is a quite important difference so so context is all about the 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 the, the performance itself uh, when something is said or written um, like the, the who is it written by who is it written to what are the intentions of the people involved uh, uh, what is the the, the specific uh, 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 locus, the uh, uh, time and place of, of it happening and so on, what, what are the kind of uh, topics they are discussing, and all these matters that are about um, uh, 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 the specific act itself, the specific uh, 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 sentence, not sentence, but, but the, the, the performance of the sentence, um, while then the thing you call possible or at least in Kaplan's picture, um, the, 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 where, where the modality comes in is in a completely different level uh, where you're going to evaluate what has been said. So you first, uh, um, uh, uh, you can do that, I mean, independently. Uh, so uh, there can be something that Newton has said, long time had said, long time has said, long time ago. Uh, he said, uh, I uh, uh, believe that, blah, 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 blah. And, and of course, we have to know the I and the context of what all these words may meant and so on um, uh, to, to know the kind of proposition that he tried to utter. Um, and as so, soon as we have a proposition, uh, 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 by knowing enough about the context, we can evaluate that, con that, that, that proposition in different circums possible circumstances or impossible circumstances. I mean, we can, we can uh, uh, say, well, uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 the, the person who uttered it thought it was true, but, but we can imagine, uh, uh, we can find ourselves that it's not true. Can we can imagine a world where it would be false. Um, we can vary the, 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 the situations for evaluation. Um, so I'm a bit wondering where uh, your situations lie. Are they on the evalu evalu evaluative? Sides, or more uh, uh, in the, the the performance of the exper experiment, and do you want to make the distinction between the two, uh, or do you want to be like, is this for your specific purpose, not uh, an interesting distinction to make? 
context of evaluation and context of uh, yes uh, a good question <laughs> uh, yeah maybe I'm not familiar enough with uh, with these distinctions between context of evaluation and context of uh, oh, utterance or yeah, well, utterance uh, is maybe a good way to call it. Uh, yeah. But it, it doesn't require much for familiarity. My question is not meant to be deep. Uh, um, just about, do you care at all about uh, uh, utterances or something like that? Are you interested in the, the experiments, qua things that are actually happening uh, uh, with people involved and so on, and, and research questions and, and these things? And, 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 and do you think we can maybe evaluate science, uh, uh, try to still see possible ways to evaluate what comes out of the experiment uh, without, like, uh, we, we already after having fixed uh, a context, so can you make this distinction? Uh, uh, my idea uh, would be that there is a I think the, what I'm talking about is more like uh, the equivalent of a context of utterance. Mm -hmm. So there is a, like when I say relevance conditions, it's where people are speaking, they're speaking about a specific situation, some stuff uh, that is there, that must be there if, there if the model has meaning at all, if it is to apply to something, it must be there. And then you can come up with a story about how to evaluate the model, but it's like a different story that I didn't really talk about. But you could say that if the model says, uh, okay, so the context is that you have this situation and you have uh, three possibilities, and the model say the first one is impossible, it must be one or two or three, then you can evaluate, you say, oh, imagine the first one ha happens, then the model is, uh, the bad model. Imagine two or three happen, then the model is, is still uh, adequate. So you could have this story then, maybe to evaluate the empirical adequacy of the model. But what I'm f trying to formalize is more like the context of utterance, I guess. Okay. But just yeah. to follow up, but you would hope that in science there's more transparency between you know, utterance and the reception. Uh, at least you. It's not like the example you gave. Newton said, "I blah blah blah." It's in the past. I don't know if there's a Newton. If there's really someone, I have the person receiving this proposition has to do all this this evaluation of contextual information. I believe that you would hope that f there's a lot of work at the beginning of the thing, the utterance context, let's say. Yeah. Production of stuff that would be almost transparently <laughs> interpreted by people around. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Hopefully. It's probably false, but, you know. I mean, the, yeah. It's a bit, uh, part of the project is idealistic and I, I don't want to because I, I don't think that we can uh, claim to provide a framework that would be exactly uh, uh, describing exactly everything that happens. So part of it is, is, is admittedly an idealization of what happens. And, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> Another question I'd have is, uh, unless, again, please interrupt, I don't want to like, monopolize the rest of the discussion or something like that. Um, Another question, question I would, would have is about these weights uh, and the weighting. Um, I, I, I really don't <coughs> see the intuition there, um, except if it's some kind of a, a, a weight, just like have a smaller situation. You call it fine graining, but I don't think that's actually a very good word because adding information is not adding grain necessarily grain. You know, it, it's 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 it because the the word is used a lot in this literature, and then specifically the kind of thing you're interested in is having uh, uh, models that have uh, that can distinguish more things uh, 
Uh, it's just like the lens has become more detailed. Uh, um, mm. That's a fine grain. While in your case, if it's just um, if, if the situation is uh, become smaller, um, it's not that you have so all of a sudden a more more yeah, detail. It's just that you have you shrink your possibilities. It's more information, but it's it's another kind of. So I don't think the term is very practically chosen if I can. I think I agree, but may maybe for it's more adequate for when it comes to partitions. Well, yeah, th then it might be useful. A partition can be more uh, fine grained or more coarse grained, but yeah. that's not how you explain it here, I believe. Um, you you so, said yeah. you, you spoke about fine grained and coarse grained and, and, and yeah. the size of the situation, qua sets of possible world. But there's this idea that if you describe the condition of application of your model without describing the outcome, it's kind of a blurred view of the situation. You say, there's a pendulum. I'm not seeing what it's doing, it's doing, but there's a pendulum and uh, it will have some, uh, yeah, that's it. And then fine graining could s would be how oh, this pendulum is acting this way precisely. So that's the idea, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, but that's just getting more information about something and it's not necessarily yeah. going into more detail, you know, that there's, um, at least in this, if you refer to that literature, then maybe. Yeah, I'm like not talking about the purely the the the, 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 the the like how detailed the partition can go. That could be a fine graining in the more traditional sense of the word. So, yeah. but that's just a, like a friendly suggestion. But I was actually wondering about the weighing. Um, so, of course, I can see that sometimes it's useful to to or you can apply a model, and then your situation gets even smaller uh, because it's not uh, the general thing, but more specific. Um, but the weighing suggests that you can also have like uh, um, other like probabilities or something applied to it. And then I, I just don't. Could you give a simple example, um, not in physics, if if possible, uh, uh, that that could capture this idea why application would be a form of weighing? I, I don't I don't see the link between applying and and, and weighing. Uh, uh. No, so the weighting, the weighing is the these are the predictions of your applied model. Uh, but a, an applied model was, if I don't do my, um, mistake, is a situation, a so situation plus so yeah. weighing. So for example, uh, uh, I should find an example. It's not from physics. <laughs> uh, yeah, what you said is apply models weight weight the cells of the partition of context of application. So what does it mean? So you have a, you have a state space, but it's not in physics. It's the <laughs> atmosphere. You have the temperature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> And the pressure of the atmosphere. <laughs> okay, then I, I understand <laughs> pressure and, 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 and temperature. That's all right. <laughs> that amount of physics I can handle. <laughs> then you, your model says, oh, the, the, the atmosphere is such and such. You have such and such constraint that comes from uh, the sun and everything, the earth, etc. Which means that uh, if your system is there at t equals zero, it should do something like that. I, I invent something. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, its trajectory in state space should be that. So the temperature will rise, and then it will stay stagnant, and the pressure will rise, I imagine. Uh, but then you plan to experiment on, on your uh, atmosphere, but you will just measure uh, with a finite precision, so I will take another color maybe. I mean, your apparatus are finite, uh, and precision, in range, so basically you have a kind of partitioning of your state space. Mm -hmm. So this is your experimental situation, which in this case is just an observation situation, but I use experimental situation in general way. 
to just observing this experimenting. Uh, and what your model will say, your, in order to apply your model, you will project the theoretical model, which is the continuous trajectory. This is a theoretical trajectory, by the way. I'm not saying that the atmosphere really uh, follows this continuous trajectory. This is what the theory says about this kind of system. And if you apply it, you will, you will see that basically you have to project the continuous trajectory onto your partition, which means that basically this will be your, mo your apply model will say these cells have probability one. You could index in time, but let's simplify it. Uh, these cells can happen, there are possibilities. And this one cannot happen. Uh, well, <laughs> this one, yes, it can. Okay, this one, for example, cannot happen. The, your system would never be found in this cell. And maybe if the trajectory spends more time here, it will give a higher probability weight to this cell. And if it, here it's just there's a tiny passage, maybe it will be a low probability here. For example, that could be the idea. It's, it's an intuitive idea, I don't need to be very rigorous, but and so what, up, what applying your model does is putting weights, here it's almost a one or zero, but it could be a probability in some cases, to the cells of your context. I see. Um, and saying this is a permitted state, this is an impossible state, a forbidden state, forbidden by the theory. Conditional to t equals zero, to, to initial yes. condition. But then you, you, yes. But if you don't want to specify, you can still do it by history. Okay, so um, the the the, the possible outcomes you had in the beginning before the weighing mean nothing at all. That just uh, Whatever is, is measured. It, it's how the variables work or something. I mean, it, it doesn't have, it, the world does not no impact on. on you mean the, the continuous trajectory or the cells? No, no. Before the weighing, uh, the, the cells. picture before the cell and the cells or um, the, ink, the, 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 in the the content of the cells. Uh, just the the the, the, the yes. The, the, the plane itself uh, yes. uh, is, 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 is without restriction. The modality comes in at the weighing part. Yes. The theory only yeah. has influence. I mean, are the... Yes, and no, if you go to, uh, to quantum uh, mechanics, you would, want, you, would, you would want to say this black stuff, this grid, it should be consistent with the... So there's a, that's a specificity of quantum theory, that even the grid has, uh, the theory tells you <coughs> some grids uh, are consistent, others not, you shouldn't apply this grid. So if mm -hmm. I wanted to go uh, infinitely precise in both, if I wanted to apply an infinitely precise grid and just take the full uh, state space uh, on the continuum, that would be forbidden by the theory, for example. But, but that's a very specific situation in general. But you, you want to have uh, you, the idea you have uh, behind uh, these these state spaces or or, or or sets of possible worlds is that they they are not possible in, in any kind of deep sense of it. Just like uh, it's about purely yeah, theoretical constraints. Yeah. Not it doesn't say anything about the laws of nature or whatever. Uh, yeah. It's just what you conceive of as possible, as 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 as, as uh, like mathematically uh, 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 conceivable, kind of, but uh, with the caveat from uh, quantum mechanics, yes, you could take it like that. But the point is that I would like to verify this in the end. So I would like to say we know that this grid exists because we know we are capable of measuring it, we, because we will measure, make this measure, and we're confident that we 
we are able to do it, so we are confident that the grid is somehow real. And we can postulate that finer grids are real also because information goes from the atmosphere. That if we had more uh, capacities, we could refine the grid to a point. But this kind of inference that a finer grid exists out there in the world, in principle, well, the idea that from quantum mechanics we should be uh, very, we should, we should think that maybe it's not true, that it's, it's a postulate, and it's not necessarily the case that an infinitely precise grid on this system is uh, actual. So I want to refine the grid as well. I don't really see what that means to reify it. I mean, where does it live, qua object? I mean, it, it, it's um, and and um, you know, the, the, my, my whole problem maybe is is related to the fact that I see these these topics or the, these 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 partitions you talk about as as questions. So about them one day, um, uh, as, as Lou is also interested in them. It, it, and, and I think this is really interesting for exactly to capture the sort of experimental context. So you have a, a context in which you um, um, uh, have certain uh, information shared among a, a group of researchers and they ask a question to the world. Uh, um, and so it is indeed very important to understand correctly what goes on uh, uh, in such experiments, if if we can have a theory of questions in there, of, of, of yes. but, but, but the question is, is what we do, right? That, that's yes. the world, but, but it, there could be restrictions on the questions we can ask. Uh, uh, that I find very natural, uh, and that comes from the world. Uh -huh. um, but it's still something else than, so the partition is the question, and. But there is maybe some partitions only that can uh, uh, be askable questions uh, due to the restrictions in which we live. Okay. Um, uh, but so then, if I wanted to do some, it's because I, uh, I, in the end, I'm going a bit towards, I'm making a small step towards metaphysics, and I wanted to do some kind of metaphysical job as well. And that's what basically, as far as I understand, that's what you criticize. So, but so I can, what I can do is just give an intuitive uh, picture that there's a question and we ask, and then we, we could say, but if we restrict our view of reality to the question we actually ask to the world, and we cannot say that only that this exists. So we cannot say that when we look elsewhere, nothing else exists because we're not looking, we're not asking questions to the world by looking at things. Uh, it's a bit uh, too radical, too relativistic to think that. And so let's, let's make a step towards metaphysics, which is, I think, common, remains commonsensical and we have a kind of common sense, and assume that things still exist when we're not looking. And so this implies somehow that there are questions asked by nature to itself, by part of nature, to the part of nature uh, that lie in the interaction between the between stuff, and that not we do not necessarily know much about what these questions are, <laughs> but we could kind of postulate that there is a state that if there is a state of the matter as to whether we will measure this. But there is a state of matter about whether it's in this cell or this cell. So in principle, we could refine. And our, our theoretical model say what can inform us about this situation that we are not directly, this question that we are not asking directly. But our theory still informs inform us about it. And the fact that there is an answer means that somehow the environment of the atmosphere asks this question <laughs> to the atmosphere. That there's information that goes from the atmosphere to to the outside world, or something like that. And yeah, yeah I understand that it's a bit. Uh, uh, it's not very uh, precise way of talking. But, uh, 
Yeah. But there's a precedent. This. There's a precedent. Feynman was talking about. Oh yeah. But the question is, do we need it? I mean, uh, well, yeah, already at times also talk about it. He talks about question as to can all the means. Yeah. But do we need it? That's a good question. Yeah, well, because I, mean, <laughs> I mean, the the, the kind of thing. It's a, yeah. It, so if you make a distinction between the partition, which is uh, maybe up to us to to just uh, 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 be interested in a certain partition at some point, but there might be restrictions on possible partitions. Yes. Um, and that might be due to the world. Uh, yes. Or, or to our restrictions uh, as, 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 as people. But uh, um, that, I mean, a question doesn't have to have an independent existence or something like that uh, um, for it to be a possible question. You know, uh, we don't have to um, say that. Uh. No, but because of quantum mechanics, you you want to say at least that if this question exists, then another question cannot exist in the world. You want to say something like that. Well, yeah. So that's a restriction on what possible questions can be asked, which is fair enough. There's nothing in contradictory for me against that. Uh, but saying that the question is already out there. I don't know, that seems like <coughs> turning around. Uh, but it's just uh, when you say information transfer between yeah. non cognitive stuff, what do you mean? It's <coughs> saying that there are questions out there is just a metaphorical way of speaking. But, uh, but I think that, yeah, we don't need it. Uh, strictly speaking, and the only reason to accept that is just the kind of common sense view that I was uh, expressing, that we believe that s there are still some stuff out there when we are not looking, and, then, and that it's kind of structured. I mean, you can be some kind of Kantian, Neo-Kantian or something, and say, no, the questions are just, uh, the, the just questions that we ask, uh, and uh, when we are not looking, uh, the world, the universe is a kind of blob with no structure. I don't know. I mean, that's you, you can you can uh, you can say that's that. That's not what I say. But I can say I say that. that, that I, I mean, if you assume that there there is a fact of the matter, even if no one knows that there is a fact of the matter of what lies and I don't know in a dark room here at the university, there is an object on the table, no one is looking at it, but you s assume that the object is still there, and, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a structural way of speaking, it's not like a blob, uh, etc. So we, if you have this minimalist uh, common sense realism, I would say maybe, uh, then it's tantamount to saying that there is an answer to the question, there is an actual answer, to the question, is the object there on the table? Yeah, sure. I don't deny yes. that. But that doesn't mean that the question already exists. I mean, we yeah. always we, we are the question. So the question supervened on the fact that there is an answer. No. That's weird. That's weird, can't they? There is an uh, That's weird to say that the question supervened and has some common. Mm -hmm. But Ontological if, you don't, if you don't accept that, you need to accept that there is an infinitely fine-grained uh, question that determines what there is in the world. I don't want to no. say that. I no, want to no. say that whether there is an object no, or no. No, the fine-grained is a question that you won't have any answer because it's a bad question. That's all. Does it mean the question exists supervened? It exists in principle in the sense that there is a there is an answer to it. In the because sense that, that there is information about this stuff, this because, topic yeah. that because goes from the the this situation in the the room where no one is looking, there is a fact of the matter, which means that there is some kind of information about it that goes from this situation to the outside world somehow. But and uh, this 
can be codified or formalized by a kind of partition of possibilities. Yeah, but and if you're not doing that, I don't know how you can express the... But it will commit you to things like... The, the, that there is a fact of the matter. If you don't say about what there is a fact of the matter, how can you say there is a fact of the matter? But it will commit you to buy things like the electron and the hydrogen atoms is not at the same location as its it, uh, the noyau, the core, because if it was, if he was asking, if it was asking a question about its position, it would be, it would have, it would have to force a variability of on the speed, and then therefore, there, oof, it would just get away from the center, and that's exactly like Feynman is talking, like like there was a. Uh, uh, auto measurement between the electrons and the uh, and the proton in the hydrogen atoms, like they were cognitive ag agent asking questions to each other. That, that's super bizarre. No, it's metaphorical. It's not. Okay. They're not cognitive agents. I'm not saying that everything is a cognitive agent. But if it's a metaphorical, why do not buy the very sensible Big claim people. of it? <laughs> so again, if let's take an electron. Then if there's a fact of the matter with a uh, one of the electrons here in this table has uh, I, we know that it cannot have I, uh, both a very precise mm -hmm. position and a very precise velocity but there is a fact, imagine there is a fact of the matter as a, fact, as a matter of fact it has a very precise position and not a very precise velocity then you must say that there is some kind of uh, but, but first we cannot measure that. Does it mean it has not, you know, uh, oh yeah. according to Bohm? But maybe no, it's a postulate. Maybe maybe you say uh, the refine. As I said, you can say the refining stops there. There is no fact of the matter about the electron because we're not we're not measuring it. Oh. But then, we, but then you are much more radically idealist than I would like to be. I would like to f follow common sense and say that. This fact of matters exists somehow, but I won't. I don't want to go as far as saying that they are ultimately precise uh, and uh, describable by a possible world. So I must say that there, this, uh, there are situations out there. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>